guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's Sunday and it's time for a Q&A. And today we're doing something very, very special. Instead of the normal Q&A format where you ask me questions and I answer them, I'm gonna take one subject that has had more questions asked about it than any other subject and I'm gonna do a deep dive on that particular subject. So if you asked any questions on last week's Q&A and it wasn't related to the Magic Circle, then I promise I'll answer them next Sunday. And if there's any new questions that you want me to answer, leave them in the comments to this video, and I promise the, that I will answer them next Sunday. But I get questions all of the time about the Magic Circle. In fact, if you do a Google search on my name, Craig Petty, the first thing that comes up is the Magic Circle. Uh, a lot of people want to know about the Magic Circle. I've documented in, my, in the past on this channel my history with the Magic Circle, basically. Uh, many, many years ago, I went into the Magic Circle. I went straight in as AIMC. I didn't even audition. I did a lecture off the back of the lecture. They invited me in as an AIMC member. I was a very proud AIMC member. And then there were a whole bunch of issues to do with them and me and stuff that I was doing and then wanting to dictate what I did in my business. And uh, I, I ended up leaving. I wrote a whole bunch of blogs about the Magic Circle. Uh, I was very, very annoyed. I learned something from that. Don't write blogs when you're drunk. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I ended up obviously uh, leaving the Magic Circle or they kicked me out. They would not renew my membership. Uh, fast forward several years where I've grown up a little bit. I apologise to the Magic Circle. Uh, I did an open apology on this channel a few months ago, actually, um, Took all the blogs down because I didn't believe what I said. I put them up at the time because I was really, really pissed off. Uh, and since then, I've been interviewing lots of people on Talk Magic about the Magic Circle. I've been talking about the Magic Circle in a very positive way. Obviously, it's well documented. I have tried recently to rejoin the Magic Circle and they have said, no, I cannot rejoin. So I appealed and said, please, and they've said no again. So I am well aware that the Magic Circle have no interest in me being a member. Uh, probably there's too much bad blood. I'm, am, I, am I annoyed about it? Yes. However, I'm not annoyed at them. It's their decision. I understand why they're making that decision. Um, I was very outspoken about the Magic Circle for many, many years. I have this YouTube channel. Uh, I can understand that maybe they think I'll be outspoken again in the future. I get why they don't want me a member of the Magic Circle. I get why they don't want me to be a member. I'd like to be a member because my whole goal with this channel is to help magicians become better magicians and give magicians uh, a, a, the sort of YouTube channel that I always wanted to look at when I was a magician. That's my goal and I, I, th I feel that the Magic Circle's goals and my goals are aligned. They disagree, that's fine. I'm annoyed, I'm not annoyed at them. I'm annoyed at the situation, but not at them. I still would say every single person around the world should join the Magic Circle because having now done a whole bunch of talk magics with Magic Circle members, I can tell you that the Magic Circle is a great place to be. I can tell you that the Magic Circle has some fantastic members and I can tell you that there's certain people in key positions that are working really hard to make the Magic Circle the best it can be. And I know they've had some problems recently and I know there's been some internal politics, which again I've discussed on this channel, but that still doesn't stop the fact that the Magic Circle is a fantastic club. It's probably the best magic club in the world and anybody worldwide can join and get tons of benefits because one thing that COVID has done is it's made everybody around the whole of the world more accessible. Now everything's streamed online and so on and so forth. And if you want to see more about that, go look at my interview with David Penn. He talked about it, uh, as did my interview with Noel Coulter. Noel talked about it as well. But anyway, by the by, one of the questions I get over and over again, should I join the Magic Circle and how should I join the Magic Circle? In fact, I get millions of questions. Should I join the Magic Circle? How do I join the Magic Circle? Am I good enough to join the Magic Circle? What happens at the audition to the Magic Circle? Should I quit? Um, you know, what happens if I fail my audition? What do I need to do to join the Magic Circle? How much is the Magic Circle? There's a million questions I get on a daily basis about the Magic Circle. And a lot of them I can't answer because I joined years ago and I didn't even audition. And, you know, they booted me out about five or six years ago and I haven't been in the building since then. So I can't really answer all of those questions, but I know someone who can. 
and that person is Robert Pound. Robert Pound is in charge of the examinations committee at the Magic Circle. So he's the guy that basically um, is responsible for helping people become a member of the Magic Circle. And his attitude is very simple. He wants as many people to be in the Magic Circle as possible, but they want to make sure that they've got a high standard. They have a standard they, they want to maintain. So I thought the best thing to do was to create an ultimate guide to joining the Magic Circle. And that's what this Q&A is going to be all about. It's going to be an ultimate guide to joining the Magic Circle. I sat down and I chatted with, uh, with Robert Pound. And I asked him all of the questions that I have been asked. I, I, I spoke to him about him as well, because I was actually interested about Robert pa Pound, a person. But the majority of the interview was about the Magic Circle. How do you join the Magic Circle? Every question that I've been asked on this channel, every question I, I asked Robert. And his answers surprised me, to be honest. So I'm going to present for you right now the interview with Robert Pound, where he lays everything bare. So hopefully this will answer everybody's questions. This is like, as I say, it's the ultimate guide to joining the Magic Circle. Everything you need to know and everything that you didn't need know you needed to know. Everything is going to be covered in this interview. Let's have a look at it right now. And today I am here with... An amazing magician, an amazing performer, someone who's done incredibly well uh, within his own career, but these days has become known as being um, the person that you need to get through in order to gain access to the magic circle. Uh, it is the one and only Bob Pound. How are you doing, Bob? Are you okay? I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? I am very, very good, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. I, you're busier than me. I mean, the amount of times I've been trying to organize this interview and you're like, yeah, I'm just doing this, I'm just doing that. I mean, most magicians in lockdown, they, they, you know, they've had a bit of a quiet year, but you, I think you've just stepped on the gas and you're just going, you know, doing more than ever before. Well, it, it, it was that big thing of during lockdown, I became the examination secretary, having been in uh, the, the deputy. So I've been within the department for over five years now. And when I first was in the position of taking over, there was a position, there was a situation where there was lots of people lost in the system. So right. I went through the entire database and at one point I did 700 hours in eight weeks, just trying to get rid of the, the backlog. And every time I was like, oh, well, I, I only need to do this amount of work for this week because once this is all sorted, I, I won't have any more. So I sorted all of, of one thing and then I got a phone call from Mike Sullivan, who's the uh, membership secretary going, oh, we've got all of these names and we need to sort out these as well. So. I just went through everything. I was contacting each person, sending them emails, trying to call them, just to try to make sure that they were no longer lost in the system. And I think that that that's really important. However, one thing you said in the introduction, which was that you have to get through me to become a member of the Magic Circle. And in truth, that's not completely correct. There's obviously, I, I, I head a team, a, a department at the Magic Circle. So it's not just myself, there's Brian Porter, and I've also got uh, Matthew Garrett who are helping me in relationship to processing it because if, so last month there were 53 different people that we dealt with, and, and that was between the 4th of March and the 31st of March. And admittedly, I did do most of them because we just had some changeover within the department. But oh, also David Penn was helping me during that time as well, who I know you interviewed recently as well. And it, the whole point of that was, was that what, if we can only be working when people apply. So as a result of doing other podcasts or the unlocked events or all, all the other things that encouraging people to join the club you get to a position where people apply and it was just a particularly busy month last month and just trying to deal with it in the best way that we can because when people apply to join the magic circle they want to be in yesterday so I think it is important and I know that some people will say you know speed doesn't affect efficiency but at the same time is if you sit back and don't do something it can you can then frust frustrate those people that just have this massive goal. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've noticed is since doing the Unlocked events, there's so much more interest in joining the Magic Circle. And one of the reasons that I wanted to interview you is because I've had so many people ask me, 
how do I join the magic circle? What process do I need to go through? And I think that there's people from literally all over the world with this new virtual world that we have, people are beginning to realize you can live in the outer Hebrides and you can still have an amazing experience joining the magic circle because the, the, the stuff that you guys have put to try and make sure that it's inclusive for everybody. So I wanted to get you on for that reason, but to be clear, my agenda here isn't just to talk about the magic circle. I want people to know who you are as well. Um, who is Bob Pound? I want people to know the man behind, uh, the, you know, the title, so to speak. Um, so I'd like to, if it's okay with you, before we start talking about the magic circle and what people need to do to apply and why they need to join and how amazing the circle is, before we go into any of that, can I just spend a few minutes finding a bit more about you, Bob? Would that be okay? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm unimportant in the scheme of things, but I'm very happy to tell you a little bit about myself. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, when did you get into magic, if you don't mind me asking? Was it a typical origin story of having a magic set bought for you when you were a child? So, so you get many people saying, oh, I, I, I got into magic in, a, in the traditional way. I'm probably the only person you'll ever interview that got bought a magic kit and then turned around to his grandmother and said, I don't want it and gave it back. Um, but I have to give a clarification anyone who has any communication with me in any way whatsoever it will become abundantly obvious very clearly uh, very early on that I am very very badly dyslexic I'm not very good at spelling when I was younger when I was at school my teachers used to say that I was stupid they um I got assessed by two child psychologists that said I'd probably never learn to read or write my parents were given an ultimatum that they either got me put me into private education that I got a private tutor or I'd be put into care. Now, it was a very different time. I completely realised that. And, you know, th those are difficult, difficult things. And obviously my parents did what any parent would do, as you would do for your son or I'd do for my children. They did what they could to help facilitate me getting an education. And I was always told I would never pass my exams. And thankfully I did pass. I got English, maths, physics, history, and art. So I, I did did pass the main exams. Now, I won't lie, I passed English because it was 100% coursework. And if I was sitting, sitting in the exam, I'd probably still be doing it right now. Now, the first book that I ever chose to read was a magic book. And that came about because my brother did a kibbutz. And when he came back, he'd learned to juggle. So what he was doing, he was picking oranges in the trees. And he'd reach up, he'd try and juggle, he'd drop one, so he'd just pick another one. And then he would do it again. And, and that's how he learned to juggle. And I learned to juggle just by watching him. And I just juggled three balls until I was 16 years old. And I met, got a friend who could juggle seven balls and five clubs, obviously not at the same time. And, uh, and he also liked magic. And he had the secret cabaret. So that's where I would see Ricky Jay and I know you can't see it, but I'm looking at a Ricky J poster directly in front of me. And, and I got, you know, I got interested. He showed me a, a, a vanishing handkerchief trick, uh, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. And, but he wouldn't tell me how it was done. And it took me two weeks to work out how it was done because on that train journey home, he'd shown me something, but it took me two weeks to make any connection to it. And that started me down the road. Now, Unfortunately, I never got to show my grandfather any magic. So I used to play cards with my grandfather every week because I was at boarding school and I didn't have any friends in Seven Oaks where I live. I used to go and see him every day and play cards with him. And as a result, I never remember learning to riffle shuffle cards. And it's something that whenever I shuffle cards, part of me always thinks that that is a, a remnant of, of him. Uh, in fact, my last conversation with my grandfather was about riding a unicycle which I was learning at the time and that's partly why I can date the fact that I didn't start learning magic until 1991-92 because it was af after his death and obviously I, I started learning and practicing and doing what everyone does when they first start I would buy lots of magic from from the magic shops and the majority of it was self-working. I wasn't learning skill or sleight of hand at that point because I was just that that first of knowledge. And it always amazes me that the first show that I ever did, and I did that because someone who wasn't a magician asked if I could step in and do a party because they couldn't do it. And I did tricks that I didn't learn for 10 years after I actually did the event. But I did in that party just do lots of different things. And and it sort of started from there. And and 
I don't need to tell anyone who's watching this or you what the bug of doing magic is. This is something that we absolutely love. And if you find something in life that you love, you don't work a day in your life. And I hated reading. I didn't find it particularly easy. And I went into Davenport and I asked them about a card book. I bought Royal Road to Card Magic and I lapped up that information. I absolutely loved it. And, and that's, that's where the bug started. And, you know, for a very long time, I was really bad, but I had a passion. And yeah, there were times where I didn't do it necessarily as much as I had in the past, but I went and worked in, so I worked in a theatre in Seven Oaks where I met my wife. And then my wife moved up to London to manage a West End theatre. And I came up as an usher. And then I went to the stage door of the Criterion Theatre. And when I worked at the Criterion Theatre, I was working for a lady called Sally Green. And Sally Green at that time was buying the old Vic. And Sally Green had always wanted to get Ricky Jay to come over and do his show. So I run his 52 assistant show. And ironically, I left and what started working at Davenport's just before that happened but to go back a slight step Ricky Jay who I was introduced to when I first met my friend who showed me juggling stuff but also through my sister because my sister was an antiquarian book dealer and used to deal with Ricky Jay now when I was learning to do a, a boomer I, I can take a playing card I can throw it over your right shoulder it will fly around your head and I'll catch it as it comes back over your left shoulder now that took me 10 years of my life to learn and ironically the first person I ever boomeranged a card around the head of was Doug McKenzie I was working on Dynamo's Concrete Playgrounds Dee was standing just here but facing the other way and I turned to Doug and said have you got any idea how you'd boomerang a card around someone's head and he went no idea and I went it's like you should do it like this and that was the first time I ever did it now it took me seven years to get to that point and then it was three years before I put it in my axe because I needed to get consistent at catching it because there's nothing worse than and because of how I've learned it I can go and do it outside in the wind uh, I've, I've, I've done it in many different environments and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a clip that you can put in so you can see it from above in, in a second but um, the important thing is, is about all of these people and all the way that you can connect with people. So I didn't know that I was going to work with Sally Green that was going to put on Ricky Jay's show that was going to. And I, I was working in Davenport, just started out. I worked there for two years. It was a great place. I, I think when you work in a magic shop, you have a tendency of showing everyone the stuff that, that you do. And. My goal has always been to try and help people be the best version that they are. And I'd have people coming in and going, oh, I've got a, a church service. and We need to try and make something fun and good in relationship to uh, keeping people engaged. And when I was at boarding school, I used to have to sit through a lot of those those sermons. And if you can make them fun and engaging, that's great. Now, the other aspect is my brother's a doctor in theology uh, and works at Durham University. Wow. So there's been a, that, you know, I know about the, 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 the faith and all of those things. And my grandfather was, was Jewish and uh, I've got, got that aspect as well. But there's, uh, there's many different things that I will try and include later on with little anecdotes of stories of, of things. Because we all have connections with magic, even when we don't even know, when we don't even know. It. I know when I first started doing magic, uh, I bought a pom-pom prayer stick. And my dad was like, oh, I had one of those when I was younger. And I was like, oh, have you still got it? Would it be in the loft somewhere or anything like that? No idea what happened to it. But it's interesting that you can have these, these things that, that can connect so well and, and create a story. Because there's no one in my family that did magic before me, other than, as, a, as I say, my dad playing with things when he was younger. But it certainly wasn't something that interested him. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I started Magic in 1992. I joined the Magic Circle in nine, on the 9th of the 9th, 1999. Uh, and the only reason I joined is I used to ride the unicycle from my house to my grand's every morning, leave it in her garage and then go to the train station because my the, the analogy my dad gives in relationship to how close my grand lives to the station was that when he was younger, 
where, where I live now, or probably where you live, if you're running late, you know your wife could drive you to the station and you could still get that train. Yeah. My gran lives so close to the train station that if you're running late, you've missed the train. So, uh, so I'd, I'd cycle there, I'd leave it there and I'd do it. And one day I came back from working at Davenport's and I went into the kitchen at my grand's and I re remember it so well. Uh, and she said to me, would you like to join the magic circle? And I said, not particularly. And she said, I'd like you to join the magic circle. So I did. And I found out afterwards, she'd actually watched a speech by Janet Clare, who'd been doing a talk about the magic circle. And that was what sparked my grand's interest in me becoming a member. And as I say, when my grand asked me to do it, that's exactly what I did. That's fantastic. I mean, what a story. That's that's unbelievable. Well, I'll, I'll, add, I'll add one other bit then, which which isn't. Uh, so I, I love Chan Canasta's work, as many, many people do. And I spent a long time trying to get some of his art. And I do actually have three pieces of his art in my house. And I, on my grand's funeral, I was carrying around Chan Canasta's book on uh, that uh, Martin Breeze had done. I think it was the second one. And as I was sitting there carrying it around, my grand, sorry, my uncle came up to me and he said, oh, Chan Canasta. Yeah, I know Chan Canasta. And I was like, oh, that's, that's strange. He said, oh, Gonga, that was the name of, that we called my grandfather, books him for the family business. So years ago, and I was like, oh, okay. He said, oh, I'll tell you a funny story about it. So my great uncle what could do something which we refer to as mathematic, magic which is if you gave him a five digit number and another five digit number he would give you the answer that quickly he was a highly intelligent man he never married i love putting those lines together um <laughs> and uh so chan canasta used to apparently say this thing where he says if you could work out what i was doing i'll give you ten thousand pounds now obviously chan canasta didn't have ten thousand pounds but my great uncle watched him do his act and when he came off stage apparently according to my uncle he went you did your first trick like this your second trick like this your third trick like this your fourth trick like this and your fifth trick like this and chan canasta said yes and left uh, and that was the story that I was told at my grandmother's uh, funeral. Um, but, uh, but as I say, you know, Chan Canasta's Book of Oops, his, um, his paintings, which are, are really interesting, watching the Michael Parkinson uh, effect that he did where something went wrong and he turned it around. I think it's a really good inspiration to anyone to be able to see how someone can think on their feet and, and, and do something very amazing. I completely agree with you. Now, before we, um, before we continue with the Magic Circle, you're obviously, outside of what you do with the Magic Circle, you're a very busy, full-time professional magician. You do family shows, you do close-up, you're in demand, obviously, probably less in demand than last year, but generally as a, a rule in demand. Do you, out, I don't want the answer to be join the Magic Circle, because we're going to be spending a lot of time on that. Do you have any advice for anybody watching this about maybe they're new to magic and, and they want to become a professional magician. I know we're going to say join the magic circle. Well, outside of that. Uh, I, so I think what you would do in trying to join the magic circle is what you should do irrespective of anything else. Yeah. Because no matter how good the magic circle is or your local magic club or the magic castle or wherever you want to talk about, everything starts from you if you love magic and you want to become a better magician it all starts with you and that doesn't need a society or a family member or anything it just comes from a passion of being here so the advice that I give every single person who tries to apply and is going to do an audition for the magic circle is this 30 minutes a day you go work on an act an eight to 12 minute act, which is what the magic circle one is. But I think an eight to 12 minute set is quite good because you're a working magician as well. And you know that if you're gonna go walking around a group of people, if you had a 12 minute set that you could do, you know you could do one of those tricks or two of those tricks and it's gonna work in that environment. Mm -hmm. So you spend 30 minutes a day, every day. And this is the process that I suggest. What you're going to do is you're going to work out the hardest trick that you're going to do. Or if you're a beginner, it's the first trick you're going to learn. 
and you get you get your book you work out what it's going to be and you set yourself up a camera and you perform it to the camera and you do it and then after you finish performing it you watch it back and you write notes and go well i did say um or er a lot or i did sort of sway like this because i'm a little bit nervous whilst i'm performing so i need to stand on the ball of my feet to stop that happening and you work out what you're going to do and you do that every day for a week so every day you're just trying to add that little thing and it might not change straight away but in the same way as i talked earlier on about learning to ride a unicycle i would get on that every day and i'd do a little bit i get to a certain distance and then the next day i might double it but when you go to sleep and your brain processes that information i think you can get in a much better place so then when you come back again you're doing the same thing and when you're starting i'm saying 30 minutes but in the first few weeks it's not even going to be 30 minutes unless you do it over and over more than once you at the end of the first week you add the second trick or the second easiest trick depending on where you are in your journey as a magician and you do those two tricks, you watch them back, you write notes, you're doing that every day. At the end of the third week, you add the third easiest trick or the third trick you're learning, and you do the same thing again. At the end of the fourth week, you put them into an order so you know that's going to be the set pattern that you want to be able to do. And again, you do that. And at the end of that week, you hopefully, by that stage, you've maybe joined a local club or you've got friends in magic already or, or, or whatever, and you send it to someone that you trust and respect and you go, you know, this is new, this is what I'm trying to do, but could you, it could even be a family member who doesn't even know magic and just say, tell me what you don't like. But that criticism that you're getting is only there to help and benefit you. And you take on board that advice and you work on it for the next week. And at the end of that next week, you send it to somebody else and get them to do exactly the same thing. And then you inter interchange those two people each week, because then you're getting a point where you're still getting the feedback from the people that you've but you're bouncing and you're changing. And you've had two weeks of practice. Now, if you do that for six months, I believe when I worked it out, it's 215 hours worth of practice. And I cannot tell you how much that would improve even a professional magician's repertoire if they actually did that. And if we think about it at its most basic, we're only asking each and every single one of you who's watching this to spend 30 minutes on something that you love and you want to become better at. And if you do that, I cannot tell you how much better you, if you 100% engage in it, how much better you will be six months later. Now that's amazing advice. Let me ask you a question with that. Yep. What advice would you give in terms of trick selection? Because one thing that a lot of newer magicians struggle with is selecting the tricks that fits their character and fits their style. Um, let's use John Vanderbuck, for example, Piff the Magic Dragon, there's certain things that you know that you would see John do, and then there's certain things that you would never see him do. Um, so two questions on that. One how much effort should be put in at the beginning with regards to these four tricks that you, you said the easiest, the next easiest, but should it, should some effort go into actually deciding what tricks might fit your style beforehand? And also when you're practicing this every day, if you get to a point where you're rehearsing a trick and you just, maybe you're not feeling it, maybe it just doesn't feel, you've practiced it for a while, it, you, you can do it technically, but it just doesn't feel right for you should you carry on going or should there be a point where you go, well, actually, let me take this back to the drawing board because I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. I think I need to relook at what fits my style and my character. Uh, I, I commend you on a really, really great question. So I'm gonna address that in two different ways, coming from a beginner's point and from being someone who's more established in, in, in their magical ways. I think when you start, what you do is you look at things that you really like. So I can remember, that I had Parabox by Tenio, where That's you had right. the black box and the red box and you put it inside, they go inside each other and then inside one there's a yellow ball and inside the other one there's a blue ball, but I don't understand how they fit inside each other and at the end there's a big red ball inside it. Now that was something that as a performer I really liked. Uh, I remember uh, Angelo Carbones, I think it was out of this out of control or out of order or something like that. And I did a, a thing that says, four cards I have to show to you a trick I think I'd like to, to do. Uh, a queen, a jack, a ten, a nine, and a trick I think that's quite divine. Joined together, as you see, by a little rivet just by me. Twist and turn, you will see. Stay still, they are, or let it be. Um, 
not so sure can I be, uh, they stay still away from me and I give them to the spectator, they shut them and then they'd be out of order. But that was just a little rhythm and, a, a, and I haven't done, I don't even do that trick anymore. That's going back 20 years or, 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 or probably even longer than that. What a memory. <laughs> um, but it was something that, that, that I enjoy doing. And, and so that you, you find tricks that you like and, and you work on them. And as your persona changes, yes, you may change effects and things like that, but it's about having that commitment level. And certainly when you first start, I think one of the problems is, what, Craig, when you and I started doing magic, it wasn't like you could just go on the internet and go, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, hang on a sec, I'll buy that, I'll buy that. I remember wanting to learn to do coins across, which is one of the main tricks in my act. And I had to spend a very, very long time being able to try and find anywhere where I could get the, 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 what you need to be able to do that trick. But I do remember watching David Roth's international, coin le uh, international lecture and seeing him doing the routine and saying to myself, I do not care how this trick is done, I am learning it. And that was me. And, and that's one of the things as a magician, we have to remember so importantly, because when you find out how things are done, it can be like a partner, sometimes very disappointing. But um, <laughs> but the, the, if you can remember how a trick makes you feel when you first see it, and that you can try and bottle in that and try and recreate that. And as you're right, some tricks are just not going to work with people and then they're not going to work. And I've seen it. I'm, there's an apprentice group at the Magic Circle and people go, oh, it's how frustrating it is. You spend six months working on a trick just to then decide ah, it's just not right. But that's what happens. It, it's like it's like a glass. As a magician, we are, I have a glass full of effects that we want to do. And as we find new effects, we put them in the glass, but sometimes they're going to overflow or they're going to sink to the bottom and something else is going to fall out. I can tell you there's routines that I did when I first started and we didn't have the social media bubble that we have now that we can record all of our effects that I just can't remember what I did. When I, when I first started, I worked, I, I, when I turned pro, I, I worked every, every week for seven years in a row yeah. without, without a break. Uh, and I was working in a nightclub where you couldn't talk or things like that. And I was doing routines that would fit that genre or that type of performance. But then when you step away from those and you're not doing it anymore, you struggle to remember those things that you were doing week in, week out. And that's, that's where I say it's as you're learning stuff, you're learning it to fit your persona and your cri the criteria that you want to be as a magician. I think Darren Brown makes a really good comment where he says, when you first learn a trick, learn it exactly as someone teaches it. Because once you've understood exactly why someone does it that way, you can then introduce your own nuances to it to make it yours. But understand the process before you try and change that process. Does that, do you think, does that, does that answer the question for both? It does. It, it's a wonderful answer to the question. And I think anyone who's watching this will benefit from what you've just said absolutely greatly. I do have one follow on question. When you get into magic, there are so many different ways that you can go. Oh, yeah. I mean, just within car, just within close up magic, there's cards, there's coins. And then then you've got stage and you've got manipulation and you've got performing on stage and comedy magic and prop based magic. Then you've got illusion shows and you've got kids shows and you've got family shows. And, uh, and, and then there's mentalism and all the different facets that that brings. It's almost like walking into a candy shop as a kid and just seeing all of this wonderful stuff and you want to grab everything. Exactly. Have you got any advice when it comes to restraint? Because it's kind of that whole thing, jack of all trades, master of none. And over time, yeah, you can learn to do everything. And I know that you're a family entertainer and a close-up entertainer, as am I. But when people first come into magic, what should they be focusing on? How do they, how do they find their niche within yeah. magic? Yeah. I think, I, I think it goes back to what I spoke about slightly earlier, is it's, it's going to be different than it was for you or I, because the world is so much more available than it was that there is a constraint in relationship to what you just said because i was thinking if i was starting out and i wanted to do an illusion an illusion show uh, i i need to get a new mortgage 
and that's certainly going to restrict me. I mean, you have things like Mark Wilson's Complete Course in Magic that has quite a good section of, of illusions in the back. So it doesn't have to be expensive, but it's also about the, the space. I was listening to um, a lecture at the Magic Circle where they talked about the Junior Reading Day the other day. And I thought it was really funny because someone mentions you could tell how big someone's front room was by the size of their act but by, by the way that they were doing it uh, and i and i thought I, I that that did make me smile because you are limited by the constraints of what what you do do and therefore i say you go back to that point i said at the beginning you watch something and if you like it and you feel that that's something that you would want to do. And I do realize that when you first start, it's a case of going, I just want to know how it's done. Mm. And, and there is that point that you can get that, oh, excited. Oh, oh I'm excited. Oh, oh I'm excited. Oh, but I think that's a process that we all sort of go through. I don't, I, maybe it's different for the modern generation because magic is so accessible. But I think you've got to get to that point where you, I, I watch things now and go, do I want to perform that effect? And if I do, well, then I'm going to learn it. I, I, I wanted to, to learn a, a truffle shuffle. And as a result, I did it every day for six months to get it so that I could do it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, I suppose there's something else that you said a minute ago, and you said there's so many different cards and things. I've always learned one way of doing something. So I'm not going to learn... 10 different ways of doing a double lift, for example, because that there's no benefit in me having 10 different ways of doing it. Now, I may learn a method, the Royal Roads card method, which isn't necessarily that good, but it does what it says on the tin and it encourages you to help start. And then I get to a point of going, I want to learn a much better way of doing it and then spend a lot of time learning to do it a different way. That, that's, that's very, very different. But it's, but it's not a case of going, I'm going to know I'm going to know 26 methods of combing my hair just so that I can comb my hair. That, that, that will interest some people, but as a performer, that doesn't interest me. If, if you are a technician, entirely different kettle of fish. And there are people that just want to be the best car technician or coin technician, go down that route and they're not necessarily as interested in performing. But you've got to spark that passion that's inside you. And it's, it's what you love. So there is no hard or fast rules it's about following your heart and doing what you want to do absolutely completely agree and on that point it's like vernon said if you know a thousand forces and one revelation you know one trick if you know one force and a hundred revelations you know a hundred tricks yeah. um uh, completely 100 percent. this has been amazing advice uh bob it really has now before we go on to the circle one other question about your own personal journey you said that you joined the circle in 1999 because um, you know your, your 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 nan told you to, which is wonderful. I love that story. Obviously, uh, you've now been in the circle for 22 years. That's a very long time. Um, how, how did you go from uh, a, a person who just joined to where you are right now? I mean, did did you have aspirations of being in the role that you are now or did that happen over time so I, I i don't really have any aspirations for anything as such it's about giving back to the art that i love it's been great to me you know i i, I sit in my house purely and simply because of what magic has done for me mm. and and i think that's that's important so when i first joined the magic circle i joined because my gran asked me to and I wasn't, if I'm frank, I wasn't particularly impressed initially. I saw a lecture and I just didn't like the way some people were disrespectful to the, to the lecturer. And uh, that, that swayed me for a long time. And I never really, you know, I, I would sit at home and I would criticize the magic circle. And my wife is, you know, my wife and I are a team. I have no secrets from my wife. She knows how I do all my tricks, but again, I don't need to tell her because she's got a very good brain and, and it actually helps me when working with some things. She's, you know, she's not necessarily the biggest fan of magic, but at the same time, as she encourages me, as we hope, everyone has someone who's there to encourage someone. And for years, I would be critical of things at the magic circle. 
and she said you can't criticize if you're not prepared to stand up and be counted and it was something like 12,000 dollars basically it was about 10 years after I joined maybe even longer than that that I got booked to do a show at the magic circle nothing to do with the magic circle a client had rung me up asked me to do a show it's very different now you have to be a member to to perform there and it has to go through uh, the, the thing but at that point you could be booked and you could go in and that's exactly what I did and then I um, I used to do some shows with Chris Wood does a close-up show and I used to perform with Hugh Nightingale and unfortunately just over five years ago in January um, he was cutting a tree and, and it fell on him and it killed him now because I worked with Hugh I thought well, maybe I should put my name forward and I should go for the deputy role. And I did. And, and I basically got the role. I don't, I don't think an immense amount of people went for it, but I, I went for it. And I've never hidden from the facts that I'm not very good at writing and spelling and things like that. But as the deputy, I felt that I would be able to, to, to help out and do stuff. And, and I started and that that continued so my wife used to help me I'd write the letters I'd then give them to my wife my wife would check them I'd then pass them on to David Weeks who would then check them and then if they were cleared I would then once council had made a decision I would send them because the deputy's role has always been the responsibility of doing the not getting the result you're looking for letters then uh, a conversation with Mark Lee suggested that people should go for council so I made the decision to, OK, I'm going to go for council. And then by a, an off chance conversation with Mark, he said, um, oh, no, you're doing something. I, I didn't mean you had to do it. So I didn't put my name down. And then afterwards, when I spoke to him about it, he went, oh, no, you should have put your name down. So the following year, I put my name down and, and, and I got in uh, and I've been on council for three years. No, it's not. It's not all good. It's not all bad. You try and run the club the way that fundamentally we are representing the members and doing what the members want and that is by far the most important thing i'm, I'm genuinely not trying to get anything out of it myself it's not and i think it's very important for anybody that's watching this to realize just just interrupting you there and i'm really sorry bob i want people to know you don't get paid by the magic circle it's not like this is a a paid role this is something that you do because you love magic and you want to give back. I, I, council isn't about giving back as such. That's about helping shape the organization. And my, my, my theory and relationship to council is very much falls back towards my gran in as much as she thought so much of an organization that she knew nothing about that she wanted her grandson to join it. And if there is a perception or a feeling that someone like my gran who had no connection with magic whatsoever wanted me to become a member then i would like to try and keep that going and i can knowing a little bit more about the history now i know that back in the 30s and 40s the magic circle would have television shows so you would have people there was only three channels back then or maybe even two i have i don't know and people were watching magic on television from this amazing organization called the magic circle and as a result it created a reputation now the magic circle has always been a club for amateurs and professionals but because of what that is it, it, it opened up the door for people to do things and that's why i think that i do counsel because unfortunately a few years ago she died she didn't want to be alive she'd been very unwell for a long time and and that was a godsend it wasn't it's nothing to be upset or or sad about but the reason that i became part of the exams team is that we are holding those dreams of those people and i think it's really fundamentally important that we don't bring any prejudice into that role just because someone has i don't know run over my cat for example that would make absolutely no difference to me whatsoever in relationship to giving them the opportunity to becoming a member because that's not my right. And the whole thing about the magic circle is if you have a passion and you really want to do it, it's as there's 
Tom Marlinger does a talk at the Magic Circle when people become apprentices and become full members. And he uses a quote, which is, it's like a gate. The gate's there. You have to walk up to it and open it and walk through it. You actually have to walk up to it and open it. It's not locked, but you have to have that commitment level. And it's about helping people fulfill their dreams. Now, you're never going to please all the people all the time. That's that's one thing. And part of the responsibility, there's, there's a rule, which is 3.3.4 of the magic circle, which basically means when people get interviewed, the responsibility is the exams team to report to council and give the information whether they think they are worthy to pass, uh, be, become a, an apprentice. Now, that isn't actually our decision. We report that. And I can tell you there's been examples where we've reported it and said, we're not convinced and they've got in. And there's been examples when we've said this person is good enough and they haven't got in. So it, it, the responsibility doesn't fall to the exams team, but it is really important that it's an impartial view. And I, and I, and I take that responsibility as an incredibly important thing in the same way as when someone doesn't get the result they're looking for, the, what, the analogy I give it is like a, a married couple. If you're having a bad day, you can have a you can have a go at your partner, and they're not going to turn around and go get out. Well, unless it's too bad, they're not going to go get out. You, I don't want you here anymore. The exams team are like that partner. You don't get the result you're looking for, and you're angry. And those levels of anger go in different different stages. To start with, you'll blame someone else. We're the people you blame. It wasn't our decision. We we only are the messengers that pass it from the exams team to council and council's message back to the person. And that's where it's really important that you don't necessarily take it to heart. There have been people who've gone onto Facebook and 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 not said particularly nice things about me or 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 other things. But the important thing is is that they're not saying it because they hate you. They're saying it because they're frustrated that they didn't get the result they're looking for. And I think that's a really important balanced decision to make and not try and take these things as personal. That's, a, yeah, 100%. What's coming across to me, um, Bob, it, it, speaking to you, and we've never spoke before, really. Um, this is the first time we've really chatted. You are so passionate. I think if I had to use one word to describe you, it would be passionate. You're very passionate about what you do. You're very passionate about the role that you have within the magic circle. Do you find that you have, um, is, there, is there a sense of, um, I don't wanna use the word overwhelm, that's not the right word, but is it, you are responsible for making sure that these new magicians that are coming and applying for the magic circle, you're responsible for guiding them through to eventually becoming full members. Does that responsibility kind of weigh on you a little bit sometimes? Like, oh my gosh, I've got to get this right because I'm dealing with so many people's dreams and aspirations. And so again, it's a great question. I don't necessarily feel that responsibility. I, I, I feel that responsibility if someone doesn't get the result they're looking for in relationship to interview because we've got some really good facilities. And I'll talk about those first before I go back to that point and remind me if I if I neglect to do that. But we have an apprentice group, which is new. It's only been around for just over a year. And because of a, a review that just happened, the exams team are now no longer we have no input in relationship if you've got a question in relationship to your act you don't ask us because there have been points where people have blamed us because in the same way as I said we become that point of, of blame that's not a problem but because of things that have happened as a result of us being blamed we are now impartial so we point people to this apprentice group now the apprentice group is great if you want to think about the most amazing place where everyone is encouraging, everyone's in the same boat and they want the best for you as you can, that is the apprentice group. People are working on their acts, they're doing that revision process that I described to you earlier on and they're going, oh, I'm, I'd really like to show a magician some magic and they're like, is anyone available? And you've got people jumping in going, yes, you will, well, you can show us. Obviously, I don't partake in that, but I can see this happening. And I can tell you that since this has happened, the um, benefits, and we're going to stop my watch. 
beeping. There we go. Uh, the the benefits that we've reaped the 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 pass rate has increased completely, but it's also got to you've got to take into account that it's what people are prepared to do. Not everyone engages with it, and it's about the work that they do towards that but that apprentice group is absolutely fantastic they have their own lectures you have people being disappointed that they have to leave the apprentice group because it is such a warm and fuzzy place and then you get people like Tom who wanted to be part of it so much that he bred the uh, the leaving videos and has enabled himself to be able to stay it because he was a particularly supportive person and he is one of the reasons that that group became as friendly as it was because he would ask questions that were you know oh what's your favorite deck what's your what what what, what have you been working on today and then ask something really poignant maybe the working on is the poignant question but he'd ask two pointless questions to encourage conversation and then one that actually means something and I think if with everything if you surround yourself with people that are 100% committed and all working in the same direction then you're only going to increase increase brilliant things and I think the the real definition of a leader is someone that takes you on the journey with you rather than stands there going you're doing this wrong or you're doing that wrong i think i think it's really important that we take everyone together i completely agree with you and i'm trying to understand the process because when i joined the circle many many years ago it's a completely different process to now so the apprentice group is that after they apply is it kind of like a a holding ground where so people apply they go into the apprentice group and then when they're ready then they'll take the exam is, so, that, is that where, where i'm just trying to work out yeah. the time frame if you don't mind so i, I give you i give you the process so i told you earlier on that i spent seven to eight hundred hours working on stuff whilst i was processing uh things that may have been actually before we started recording i have no idea uh but during that time there were people that were lost in the system so what happened was when I took over as the exam secretary, uh, I made the executive decision because you had the option when you joined to become an apprentice or go for, for full membership straight away. But if you went for full membership straight away and you did nothing, you just sat in the system and no one chased you up. And, I, and I, having done 700 hours worth of work, I never wanted anyone else to have to go through that. So now when you get interviewed, if you are successful, you become an apprentice straight away. And as an apprentice, you have one or two years. Now, there was a rule change last year that slightly got misinterpreted. So now it's, it's only one year, but hopefully after the next election, we can, we can address that. The idea is that if you join the Magic Circle to, and become an apprentice and do absolutely nothing for the first year, that would be the end of your apprenticeship. But if you spend that time and you're doing auditions or you're practicing and that could be seen, then you would get that two years that it originally was. And once you've been an apprentice, you can never be an apprentice again. And that's where there comes a great responsibility when you do the, or do the interview, that if someone is six months behind where they should be, if you turn around to them and say, we don't think you're ready yet, that's actually helping them. It's not hindering them, although it could be seen as a disappointing point. It's about helping them because every person who is an apprentice, the exams team have gone, we believe in you, we believe you can pass, and we believe we will be a better club with you being a member of it. Yeah. And I wholeheartedly believe that. So when people join, they become an apprentice and they can join this apprentice group. Most people do, some people don't. And those people that don't, I think, really are missing out because it is a fantastic community. And there has to be a shout out for Sarah Stott, and Nigel Quinn, uh, Tom, obviously, I've mentioned. But those people that are helping run that section because we do work as a team and we are helping each other. We, we regularly have conversations and I try and I've done talks from in the past as well, but they have other people doing talks. We also have a, a star seeker group which again is is very new but for those people that mmc trying to become an aimc and we're trying to do the same with that and every month i try and do a, a guest talk with with someone about how to do that that process better but the the whole point is is that 
if we offer you the help and support, that's very, very important. I'm, and, and I'm going to say something that hasn't been said. It's, it's very, very new. Uh, I'm really pleased that I approached council and asked for those people who'd been apprentices in the past and had slipped out the other side because they weren't successful, they didn't necessarily get the help and support. We now have the facility to be able to give them access to the apprentice group for six months. So we know that they're getting the help and support that they didn't get when they were trying to become a member. They can take that on board, work with those people and at least have one opportunity to become a full member of the magic circle as a result of them being in a really supportive network. Okay. Now, in my day, back in my day, back in my day, um, the way to join the magic circle was go and get good and then apply. Um, that was the, because you applied, you did, an, you did an audition, you either got through or you didn't. That's obviously not the case now. And it sounds amazing what's happening with the apprentice group. So my question is, for people out there, there's obviously lots of regional clubs around the UK. There's lots of regional clubs around the world. We'll talk about this, but the Magic Circle is not just for UK people anymore. But there's regional clubs all over the world. Would you advocate people who are new into Magic, um, should they go and get good by joining a regional Magic club? Let's say somebody's living mile, hundreds of miles away. They can't come to the Circle every single uh, every single Monday. I know that you do everything virtually, but should they go and get some experience as a performer somewhere else and then apply? Or do you think that when people, should they go straight into the, into the apprenticeship scheme? Because you've said yourself, the apprenticeship scheme, it's a year or two years and then it's done. Some people take longer to learn and some people need live interaction. And if they don't live anywhere near the circle and you've only got the sort of the virtual um, you know, the virtual process there, should people go straight into, do you understand the question I'm trying to ask? I know, I know yeah. exactly where you're coming from. So to answer your question, the Magic Circle is a club for amateurs and professionals. However, there is a standard. I think that's what step, separates it from a lot of uh, Magic clubs around the world, is that part of the whole process is that there is a standard you have to be. So if you picked up a deck of cards yesterday and you want to join the Magic Circle, it's not the place for you unless you are a natural talent and you are a Ronnie O'Sullivan type person of snooker who doesn't necessarily need to practice that much, but is still absolutely amazing. That the whole incentive is on you. And this, I think local magic clubs are the life and blood of magic because it's not, it's not, oh, the role that I have is about encouraging people who have a dream to become a, a, a a member of the magic circle but the local local magic clubs are helping shape that dream for people to get into magic it to start with and i think that's the important thing you do have to be a level and you do have to know cer certain things if you can't do a, anything with cards and you're a, you're trying to be a close-up magician well then the magic circle and and that's the only type of magic that you do the magic circle isn't probably the right place for you just yet but if you've actually gone out there and you down the, I think David Penn gave you a really good analogy the other week. Do people look at you and say, that guy's a magician or my mates think he's a, my mate thinks he's a sort of magician. That is the analogy. And I think that if you talk to those people that are close to you, who see you doing magic, they will, if they're being honest with you, will be able to give you an honest answer in relationship to that question. If, if the magic circle opened its doors to everybody, there is a standard to be a member of the magic circle. And although some people would turn around and go, oh, but Dicky Double Lift, I'm better than them. You didn't see the audition they did. They could have literally smacked their audition out the park. There's, there's one audition that I remember, and this person got a very high level as a result of it. He'd submitted the effects that he was going to do, and he called to someone, he said, name any card in the deck. And they said, I know, the king of clubs. And turned to someone else and said, give me a number between one and 52. And they said 18. He completely changed his trick. Now, that is a miracle falls into someone's feet 
and they capitalize on it. But I also think that's a really good example of how as a magician, we may have a set mindset in relationship to what we're going to do. But if we jam with the magic, jazz with the magic that we're doing, we have the capability of changing what we do. And as a result of him quit his quick thinking and him changing what he was doing, he got a better result than if he'd carried on doing the effect he was doing. Got you. And what advice would you give for somebody? And it happens a lot in magic. I, I speak to so many magicians that suffer from this, that's got imposter syndrome. Like they're very, very good. They're, you know, they've been practicing for years. They, they are definitely at a level where they could be in the circle. I mean, they want to be in the circle, but they say to themselves, and I, you know, I, I'm not good enough to be in the circle. I'm, I'm I, you know, because it is a nerve wracking situation. Bob, it is. I remember I never did an audition. I, I did a lecture and on, off the back of it, they, I, I became a member. And I remember going on that stage and doing that lecture. And I put myself into some very high profile, high pressure situations. I have never been as stressed in my life as standing on there, doing an uh, doing a, a lecture and looking in the front row and seeing people like Bobby Bernard. And, and I was just like, what? I, I just wanted to turn around and say, sorry, I've made a mistake, no lecture tonight. I, it's, a, it's a stressful situation to see the caliber of the magicians that are at the magic circle sitting there watching you when you come out and do your audition. And, and I can understand why there's people that would go, no, 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 no. Shaky hands. Do you know, what, what advice would you give somebody that's wanting to join, but they're scared to death of joining? Um. So I, I think one of the things that is important to realize is we talked about the practice earlier on. Mm -hmm. And if you have practiced and rehearsed, it, it doesn't make a big difference because you've got that muscle memory of, about the things that you do. So I, I didn't mention this earlier on, but I remember in, in a week, I performed to David Burglass, who is magic royalty, and I did a royal wedding. And the question I was asked was, was, was I gonna be nervous? And I st stood for a second and I thought, you know, am, am, I, am I gonna be nervous? I, I, I don't know. So I did the things. And the thing is, is wait, before you do something, you can be really nervous. We had someone last month that came into the Zoom show, because that's how we're doing it in the exams at the moment. And he was like, <sighs> <sighs> so obviously I had a little word with him and, um, and was calming him down. And then the, the audience came in and he stood there and he'd know, are you ready? And, <sighs> and you could see he was really nervous to start with, but the second he started performing, boom, he was a different person because that is what he'd rehearsed and that's what he'd been practicing and that's what he'd done. And as a result, I think that is, if you've done that practice, the second you start performing, you forget about everything else because you're doing the thing that you know you've done and you know you've rehearsed and you know you love. And I, and I think it's all well and good sitting there and sitting there and going, oh my God, there's Bobby Bernard or there's David Burglass or, or all of those greats in magic. But every single one of those people is, is engaged and wanting to hear what gems you have as an individual or how good you are as a performer, purely based on the fact that you're doing what you're doing. Now, every, to a certain extent, the best audience you will ever have is a Magic Hurt Circle audience. In your mind, uh, I refer to a book called In a Game of Tennis. Uh, and in tennis, the players, they practice hitting the ball so it hits that line consistently and they'll practice it over and over and over again and do it over and over again. And they are successful. Then they get into the championship point and they want to play the same shot. And that line gets much smaller. And it's that much harder because the pressure that we put upon ourselves. But if we can manage that pressure, then we will continue to glow as performers as each and every single one of us are. Because if you have a passion and you've put the work in, you will reap the benefits. Very, very good advice. Now, at the moment, you just said something there that I want to touch on. At the moment, you are doing virtual auditions over Zoom because obviously there is no other option. The room behind you on your virtual background 
is where people would normally audition. And it's a very, it, it is kind of a bit of a nerve wracking. It's more nerve wracking doing it live than it is doing it virtually. I'm sure you'd agree with me. Um, well, maybe you wouldn't actually. I don't know, I, 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 think it, I think it is, but I'll tell you how, certainly virtually how we've tried to improve it. So mm -hmm. we had a, an, an exam very early on during the lockdown process. And this person worked in a college, so he was performing on a stage in a in a college or whatever it's college theatre, and he performed. He had some people on stage, but also an audience that you couldn't see. And when he performed it, at the end, so the way that it works is the three examiners come in, they turn their cameras off, their level is put on on the screen, and there is an an audience of maybe myself and one other person uh, and and the audience that they had. That's how it was. They did their audition. When they finished, they leave, and then the examiners turn their cameras back on and we start talking, or they start talking about what they think. And one of the examiners said, I think I gave him two extra points purely and simply because of the audience reaction. Now, that made me go, okay, that's really important. If he got two extra points because of that audience reaction, we have to be that audience. So even though we're watching stuff that we've probably seen before and we're like, <laughs> that, cause that's really, really important. Yeah. And we've had some recently where people have said, can you bring some audience in? So my, my, my daughter has come in. She's so far, she has a 50, 50 success rate in relationship to AIMC and MMC in, in relationship to the grades that people get. But you've had, you know, you've had my family, you've had David Penn's family, you've had a, people in the apprentice group that I will call up because we need to make sure that the people who are being invited aren't recording that video and then sharing it due to GDPR uh, legislation. So we have to be mindful in relationship to that, but also helping. Now, when we go back into the building and I'll, I'll describe, obviously this is the Devant room. Uh, they perform here. The table can go over to one side or you can have two chairs or whatever and the audience members sit here. Now, the important thing to take into account in this is if this doesn't suit you as a performer, tell us, because we don't want to tie your hands behind your back and you going, well, I want to become a member of the Magic Circle, but I've got to perform in that way. Well, if it doesn't suit you, tell us, because we can't help you if you don't tell us that you need help. And that you know, obviously they, they perform in, in, in this environment, but that is the factor that is so important is that we're here to help you fulfill your dream. We're not there to tell you what you've got to do. Now, you can do it on the stage. It happens very, very rarely. I, I, unfortunately, I, the last person I know who did it was Diobo, who sadly we lost this, this year. Um, but he did his performance on stage. So there is that facility to do it. Obviously, there's. it used to be videos, and the thing that... I will say in relationship to videos, and I can tell you that there has been a dramatic improvement in the exams since we've gone for Zoom exams. If you do a, a video exam, you can perform a routine, make a mistake, oh, I'll redo it. But with a Zoom show, you just have to go all the way through. Now, also, the fact is that if you make a mistake when you're performing in the real world, you get yourself out of it. And that's what happens in a Zoom show. And you get credit for it. I can tell you that during a show in the theater, in the Devant Room once, someone did a karate coin and he caught the coin on his finger. Um, but something fell on the floor. I'm not entirely sure what it was. And uh, he walked out into the audience, shook hands with one of the members of the audience and thanked them for coming and then went back and carried on their set. Now, I'm convinced that person believed at that point they hadn't got the result they were looking for in their exam, but they carried on as if nothing had happened. And when they got their result, they were very happy because they did get the result they were looking for because they handled a mistake so well that it hid what they'd done and we really appreciated it as an audience and that's the thing that's so important with the videos you could get uh, there's one that i remember recently that i can only assume that it had been recorded quite a few times because what the first thing that happened when the video started is the assistant went <sighs> Now, that doesn't fill you with the excitement about what's going to happen. But when that person did their exam on Zoom recently, I can tell you the energy and the excitement about watching that person perform was 
so much better than anything else we'd seen. Now, I'd also turn around and say, I wouldn't necessarily have failed that person if I had been an examiner when they did their exam. But what we do when there is the exam and they're, they're talking, we will fight the corner of the apprentice, but it's not our decision. It is the group decision of the examiners. So. And will uh, in the future, let's just assume towards the end of this year or next year, life goes back to normal and we don't turn into uh, zombie land or something like that. Will the magic circle still be offering a virtual option for people that cannot attend live? Like we're talking people from other countries. I know, exactly, exactly. That. Yeah, people from we've, Scotland, people from, you know, wherever it may be. Uh, we've always offered the opportunity to do a, a video or a remote version. So we say we don't allow videos, but it's we don't allow them unless in exceptional circumstances. So I'll give you an example. There's a lady that lives down in Cornwall that wants to do her audition, but she lives in a in a place where the Wi-Fi connection isn't very good. So her fear is that if she does her audition, it may be that it keeps blacking out or you hear her and we don't see her. So, of course, we've turned around and said, absolutely not a problem. Send us a video and we'll do it. Someone else recently asked and they they didn't like the fact that it had to be a live Zoom show. And they said, oh, I want to do an illusion act. And I'm not entirely sure I can do that in in that situation. But they came at it from the point of going, oh, OK, well, if I've got to do it, I have to change what I'm doing. And our reply was, no, 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 you can do that. Send us a video because that is an exceptional circumstance. We're, we're not unreasonable. We're not trying to be unreasonable. We're trying to make sure we meet the criteria of our forefathers and foremothers who've gone before us, but at the same time are um, giving you the best opportunity to get the result that you're looking for. Got you. On that question, and by the way, I hope you don't mind me bombarding you with questions as you're saying stuff. It's um... no, no, it's th that's the way that we. Th the only way we're going to get answer people's questions is if someone like yourself asks them. I've got, I've got no problem answering questions. Perfect. Let's say I know some exceptional kids entertainers, and they are phenomenal, and they do magic, but magic that's designed for children, very basic magic from a from a close-up magician's point of view but their performance level is incredibly high. The, the way that they use those props, despite being semi-automatic and self-working, they do it incredibly well. And you know as well as me, there's a certain type of skill to be able to do prop-based magic that's very, very different to, to close-up. So if someone's a kid's entertainer that, wants to, that just does kid's entertainment, but they do magic, obviously, as part of their show, and they want to join the magic circle, can they still, like, they'd probably find it very awkward trying to do a kid show in front of a uh, in front of a, an audience of adults because try as hard as you can it's very difficult to pretend to be a five-year-old um speak for yourself that's all i'm saying well, <laughs> <laughs> would, 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 would that be a case of sending a video in in front of a live kids show audience or would you say well actually we'll 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 react accordingly please do it over zoom what what so, so it's a good question we've actually got one coming up i know uh i know we've got someone who's just messaged and he's going to do exactly that but i will give an analogy of a, a um a lady that did a, an audition at the magic circle and it's not it's not a kid's show it's it's a mentalism effect they did a tossed out deck which technically doesn't really involve an immense amount of skill and that was the only trick they did in their 12 minutes but I can tell you it was hilarious. The character that she played, the performance, the audience reaction was phenomenal. It was very, very, very good. Now, we do have a criteria within our marking structure that if one element is so good that it can supersede the other element. So if your performance is flawless, you could get in by doing three self-working tricks. But if you put one uh or um in it, you would probably not get the result you're looking for. So it would be an unwise thing to probably do. When it comes to children's magic, it's you've got to remember that the exam is eight to 12 minutes, which we are professional magicians who do children's magic, know that that could be one routine. My, my, my unequal ropes routine is 25 minutes long, which I realize is, is crazy when you think about it, but that is the routine. So you're having to do something slightly bespoke for the magic circle so that it meets that criteria. Now, I know that 
as a close-up magician and as a kids magician and family performer that I can do a bill switch and I have a specific routine that I do with children that works for everybody by doing that but I also realize it's not going to work not every performer is going to be able to do it a torn and restored newspaper will work for for all audiences so it's very much about the trick selection that you do and becoming up with something bespoke for the magic circle audition because you're having to do it in such a short constraint of time but it's not going to go against you that you're doing self-working magic as long as the performance and and everything is there because if you don't get the result you're looking for and there is someone that i'm thinking of off the top of my head that did children's magic uh, and didn't get the result they were looking for but part of the reason they didn't get what they're looking for is as they started performing something they would do something and they would go okay here in a sec and then they come back so they would do something with their back to the audience and then come back and that was deemed to be something that was negative yeah. and that was given back to them but it, it's so important that they get the help and support they need to be able to do what they're doing. And I, I agree, children's magic and mentalism are something that I do genuinely feel need to be addressed. And it's only because other complications have happened this year that it haven't, they haven't been addressed. But we do have specific examiners who are there who are children's magicians that are respected within the industry so that you are getting the credit for the things that you are doing. Makes absolute perfect sense. Now, up until this point, we've talked about, well, actually, I've got one other question, which is if somebody doesn't get the result they're looking for, they've gone into the apprentice group, they don't get the, uh, the support, they, they, they've, they've gone for their audition after, say, six months, it's not worked out for them. I'm guessing they get put back into the apprentice group. I see. They never leave the apprentice group until they've got right. the result they're looking for. Uh, obviously, the, that, that is a year or, or two years, depending on, on the rules at a particular time. But if you don't get the result you're looking for, you get that advice and you have to work at it for another six months before you can do your audition again. And that is the benefit that's there is it's you have that help and support that's enabling you to be able to do these things. Uh, so, so what happens, Bob, if uh, after two years, there's somebody who's tried and tried and they've maybe tried maybe three times to pass and they've failed each time. Uh, we know that you've said they can't go back into the apprentice group. They then go away, they continue to work on it and they come back a year later. Are they still allowed to um, take an exam? So Are they given any support? You, along that? Yeah. you can carry on being, uh, you can, you can do, carry on doing exams every six months. Right. But the rules of the club as we have them is that once you've been an apprentice, you can never be an apprentice again. And that, that name might change. It might change to a to provisional or whatever. If that name changes, it's still going to be within that, 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 that structure. Once you've been it, you can never be it again. Okay. Now, obviously, I did instigate the thing about having someone who was able to join the apprentice group for six months. And I can tell you that three people have recently done it. One person last month did their exam, absolutely flew through. They were an apprentice 10 years ago. I feel that we as an organization have genuinely missed out as a result of how good they were uh, and what they showed as a result of now. But it, it, hopefully they are getting the help and support that they need to be able to pass within two years. And in truth, there is no one more bitterly disappointed if someone doesn't get their result, well, they're going to be disappointed, but as a, as a part of the exams team, I'm disappointed as well because I would have said, or our team would have said, that we believe you can pass within two years. And, it, and to a certain extent, although there may be a, a level of responsibility on them, there's also a responsibility on us that we said that we felt that they were in that position. Now, fortunately, no one has fallen off the end for, for at the moment because during lockdown no one stopped being an apprentice and when the building reopens there'll be six months before they have to do their e exam if that makes sense but I, I would like to think that each and every single one of them will get the result they're looking for because that's what they they've highlighted they have that skill and that ability when we've interviewed them so mm. okay now up until this point 
we've been talking about the process of joining the magic circle what, um, and, 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 and how everything works. Let me ask you a question now, Bob. Tell everybody that's watching this, many of which, uh, you know, I look at the uh, analytics, this YouTube channel, I have over, uh, I have more viewers in America and Canada than I do in the UK. So, and I've openly advocated on this channel, the Magic Circle is now a place where you can join regardless of geographical location because of the systems and things that you put in place to enable everybody from all over the world to join. Could you please summarize why somebody should join the magic circle so that anybody who's watching this that hasn't even considered it in the past um, knows why it's so important that they should join. Well, I'm, I'm going to broach it for all so those people who may have done or may have thought about it in the past mm -hmm. and say why it's good. So when I joined in 1999, if I lived in outer Mongolia, I would have seen absolutely no benefit in joining the magic circle whatsoever. However, now I think it is an entirely different kettle of fish. When you join, you get access to lectures going back to 2016. And those lectures, they're not all great, but there are some real diamonds within there. If you were to get, there's over 200 videos, probably almost over 300 videos now. If you had that sort of access to a library and you'd bought it, it would cost you far more money than it would to, to than joining the magic circle. On top of that, you have access to every single magazine going back to 1905, which is on, on the website. So you have all of that information. Now, I won't lie, I'm not, I'm not a great reader, so the magazines don't necessarily rock my boat, but there are points where I will look at videos and say, oh, I want, you know, there's a great one. And, and it, it always makes me smile. It's by Guy Hollingworth. It's a TMC TV talk and he's got a packet trick and he brings it out and he says, I don't, I, didn't, I got this packet trick and I didn't like it. So I did this and you watch him do, he's made a change. You go, wow, that's a, oh, that's really good. Oh and he goes, but then I thought about doing this and he changes it again. You go, oh my God, he's made it better again. And he goes, but then I thought I could do this. And you go, oh, wow, look. And you're seeing how someone can take a basic trick and put layer upon layer upon layer on top of it and make it so much better. And then he finished it by going very much a bit like you said earlier on, but I hate the trick, so I don't do it. <laughs> but as a way of being able to look at something as a learning tool and seeing how you can do it. But, you know, Guy Hollingworth is an amazing performer. He has fantastic ability and is is just such a credit to the community. But there are many people, we had Howard Hamburg doing a talk a couple of weeks ago. And the things, you know, the stories he was telling because he was friends with Di Vern and um, Mike Skinner. And the tricks that he was showing, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's just that is worth the membership fee in itself. The, the community after the lectures, they have a TMC TV chat where there's lots of people basically like this, but it's not just the two of us and they all have conversations. There's a really, really good community being built as a result. And, I, and I'm pretty sure David alluded to it in his um, chat that there are things that we are looking at doing going forward, if we can, that will really oh, yeah. integrate those members so they can feel even more part of it. So I genuinely believe what you're getting from being a member of the Magic Circle now is so worthwhile and i cannot think of a reason why you wouldn't want to be a member but obviously for people that live in the uk uh the magic circle headquarters is literally a stone's throw away from euston station uh so you can you know i mean i can get to euston from birmingham which is my nearest train station i can get to euston in 45 minutes if i catch the right train like literally it's crazy boom. um and, and the, the, you know, if you're wanting to meet like-minded magicians, yeah. would, uh, going on a Monday evening, would you agree that that's a, a good thing to do? Because I'll be honest with you, and you know I'm the sort of person that calls a spade a spade. Um, I call it a shovel. Well, <laughs> about <laughs> 10 years ago, and it's probably me being a little bit, I was a little bit introverted I, I, in a way, I felt, it's slightly clicky about 10 or 15 years ago. I felt it very difficult 
on a Monday evening. I went a few times. To be honest, I didn't go every week and I went occasionally. But when I went, I found it kind of, it was, I don't want to say it's clicky, but it was very difficult. To, you saw people sitting around talking and it's kind of like, how do I insert myself into this conversation? I'll just sit over there and do, do you know what I mean? And, and I know it's from having spoken to so many people, I know it's not like that anymore. So uh, I completely agree that there, there used to be. I, I remember years ago me asking exactly that question before I joined. And I, I suppose it may have reflected why I didn't I wasn't necessarily interested to join as such. But one of the things I will say is that with the apprentice group now, that is creating people that are going to be friends for life. When the building reopens, um, Megan is going to be running uh, tours of the building. So you're going to have people that don't come in and go, oh my God, I'm walking into a room and there's loads of people just looking at me. You're going to be going in and you're going to be with a group of people that when that finishes, you're going to be with a natural group of people that are talking. You have Chris Woods who sits there and jams all night and there's a group of people. I I've seen people just sit down and join in because you're going and watching the magic and then being part of it. I genuinely feel that it is a lot better now. Don't get me wrong. There is always going to be a situation where it can be difficult. If you're running late and you get there and the tours happened and you're walking in and you see all this bustle and hustle going on, completely agree. It could feel slightly intimidating. Uh, I, um, I know I interviewed someone at the beginning of lockdown who uh, was, was much younger and I was very concerned in relationship that if the building was to reopen tomorrow that they would be walking in and would feel very intimidated but what I did was I rang up someone and said please can you talk to this person and connect with them and make sure because I, I had a feeling that they would be very supportive and that's that really really works and and I think it really is going to be beneficial sorry the family are talking in the background <laughs> That's not a problem. No, that's that's great. So, and and you know, I I spoke on the channel a little bit recently about Blackpool and going to the Blackpool Magic Convention and getting a chance to sit in the Ruskin and and meet the people that you've only idolised over on these amazing DVDs. Well, you get the same thing going to the Magic Circle, don't you? I mean, you walk in and it's the who's who. You know, you can you <laughs> literally walk in and go. You talked about Guy Hollingsworth. Oh look, there's Guy Hollingsworth, and and I'm here with Michael Vincent and Guy Hollingworth and all these people that, you know, Will Houston and all these amazing people that you, 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 you spent years studying their work and they're just in the same room as you. Well, I have to say, you said, you said Will. Will's work is absolutely amazing. Just seeing him doodle doing magic whilst he's just watching something happen is, is an art in itself. He, he is, I, I make no secret that he's probably my favourite living magician. Uh, watching him work and the things that he does are, are great. And he's also the uh, author of, well, he does the Magic Circular. So although I don't necessarily watch that, I know that or read that, he is uh, he's very inter inter integral, whatever the word is. In I the, remember, uh, in oh, the he really is. I remember going to the session convention, one of the very first ones, and, and I was actually lecturing there, and Will Houston was there. And I remember Rodney James Piper trying to organise a because I, I, I'm known as a coin guy, obviously. And Rodney James Piper trying to organise a coin magic competition between me and Will. And I just flat out said, there is absolutely <laughs> no way on God's green earth I'm ever getting involved in a competition with coins with Will Houston. I am not an idiot. <laughs> he, is, he is absolutely incredible. He really is. But, but, but we make such great friends through magic. I, I, um, so I've, I've, I've worked with Doug McKenzie working with Dynamo in the past. And it's the first person I ever boomeranged a card around the head, which I spent 10 years learning to do. But he um, he's a, a friend for life. You know, you've got, I know Azzy's not a member, but Azzy Wind is again, someone I've met at the sessions and met through people at the circle and someone that I regularly will, will, will chat to through it throughout the year because he's amazing. And, and the friendships that you can create just from being within an organization and knowing people that can be as great as everything else. Absolutely. Now, uh, let me ask you one other question, which um, I'm personally very interested about um, the young magic circle or the YMC. 
Well, I, I have to say, I, I have to say, when, well, as we lead into the y YMC, this is where I have to turn around and say that I believe you are absolutely a credit to the industry, not only in relationship to what you're doing with this, but everything that you've been doing to encourage your son to be involved in magic and, and doing that and the, the, the way that you have wanted to better yourself as an example to him, I think is absolutely commendable and and I think you are really becoming a credit to the industry and not only the industry but highlighting as a as a father how important it is to guide our children in the way that we do and I I have to say that I genuinely think what you're doing is is great and uh, so I I know that your son I think he can't join I, I think it's 12 I think it is when you join the magic uh, YMC and I don't believe he's old enough just yet He's just turned eight, so it's going to be yeah. yeah. So, so, um, but keep keep up the good work. By the time he gets in there, he's going to be a role model to to, to a lot of the younger kids. Now, uh, the YMC obviously is run currently by Kevin Doig. They, I actually think, again, due to lockdown, it's becoming a far better structure because you can join it via. Um, by, via zoom yes they are currently limited but i did have a conversation with someone the other day and saying i'm not entirely sure why it's limited why we why don't you use the magic circle one you can have more people but then i do realize the more people maybe it becomes harder so i've not i'm not completely involved in it but i know that one of the things that i again asked council to introduce and i'm really pleased that they agreed to doing it is that if you are a ymc member and you have been and you turn 18 where you can no longer be a YMC member there is no joining fee to join the magic circle it is just a continuation of your journey because I think it's really important to encourage the lifeblood of, of magic to can continue going on Absolutely. and I think the work that Kevin and Alexander Crawford are doing to try and keep encouraging and helping and working with the younger generation of magicians is really really important and they have their own magazine which is done by will spencer um and it and it and it's great it's just unfortunate that you have a son that's so engaged in magic that he's too young to be able to be part of that but that but i have no idea maybe that's something that can be addressed in time but i don't know if your son is an exception to the rule and other children of a similar age wouldn't be of the same standard so I, I i don't want to talk out of turn in relationship to that yes i totally understand and is there for anybody that's watching this because again i know the analytics behind this youtube channel and there are a lot of people that watch this that are in that 13 to 18 year old age bracket so for for, for young magicians that want to join obviously there are benefits no matter where you are in the world just like there are with the main magic circle would they have to do an audition? What is the joining process with the... Uh, so I'm not completely involved with the YMC, so I don't believe there is a joining process. Uh, it's about encouraging and nurturing because when you're younger, that's when you, you start doing it. But I'm yeah. not the best person to give the advice and, and, and feedback in relationship to that. So maybe it's worthwhile having Kevin Doig in the, in the future in yeah. relationship to being able to give you more uh, advice in relationship to that. But I do think that anything that is encouraging the, the youth to get into magic and fulfill their dreams and aspirations in relationship to magic is only going to be a positive thing. Absolutely. 100%. Now, before we end this interview, uh, I've got two other questions. One is um, a little birdie tells me that there is going to be a relaunch of the Magic Circle website very, very soon. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely. We obviously we've we've we have a website that's currently with Joomla and it's going to something else. I'm not, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but I, I, I know it's Joomla because that's what I see every time I log in. But uh, one of the benefits in relationships with the new website for, for, for me within the exams team and, and my department is that there's lots of stuff that's going to become far more automated. So it's not a case of having to, to physically do it. But that whole process is going to be much, much quicker and fairer and hopefully I'll be able to supply you with some screenshots of this new website and the joining process uh, which you can put over the top of where we, we're talking now but it's the magic circle forward slash join us is where you would go and you'd get the information in relationship to, to joining now when you join you have to be proposed by two members 
that you have known for over one year. However, there is the caveat, and there is someone that recently has, has done this, who joined, he didn't know any magicians. He joined, he did his audition, and wow, it was great. He had some original magic that he'd made and he'd done, but, and he was successful in relationship to getting the result he was looking for. However, with the rules of the club as they are, he can't become a member until he's known a magician, the members for a year. So he can sit there with the peace of mind, lap up all the benefits of being in the apprentice group, but knows that when it comes to next year, he will be a member. And I think that's really important. It's that fact that he can go, I've done it. I don't need to worry. Because otherwise he'd be in a situation where going, well, I can't do my audition for a year. And then I've got to do it. And I get one chance to get in or if it gets extended for another year, I've only got a couple of chances where everyone else has four chances in a two year period. So I, I think it's really important that we are, offer that help and support to everybody. Perfect, absolutely amazing. So the new website is launching soon, uh, which is great. It's, it's, I think it's days away. <laughs> Wonderful. The, the, the process for joining is very, very simple. It, this has been an amazingly thorough, uh, thorough interview. I said at the very beginning that I wanted to make this about you and the magic circle, not just about the circle, but you as well. So I'm going to ask you one more question, um, which is, what are your future plans, Bob? Um, what is on your magical bucket list? Do you have any, because uh, you've done an awful lot. You know, we haven't talked about everything that you've done, but, you know, you've mentioned Dynamo. You've, you've mentioned the, the wonderful people that you've worked with. You've had an incredible career. You've talked about the house that you live in and everything has come from magic. You are, by any definition, a very successful performer and you've achieved an awful lot and what you're doing with the magic circle is incredible are there any personal goals that you want to hit both within the magic circle and also as a performer outside the magic circle is there anything on your magical bucket list that you have left to tick off so, so the easy one to tell you is about the magic circle i have absolutely no aspirations in relationship to the magic circle other than giving back to the community it's about being prepared to walk in someone else's shoes. And I think that if you, um, it's very easy to criticize someone. So it's very easy to, and this is the early story of me in the circle and my wife saying to me, it's very easy for me to turn around and go, I don't like how they are at the magic circle and do nothing. And that's why my wife turned around to me and said, well, if you don't like it, change it. And that's why I, why I stood up. So if ever I put my name forward for anything, I really am just turning around to the members and saying, it's up to you. I, I don't mind because as you said, I don't get paid anything for doing the exams team stuff. And I can tell you that I do over 40 hours a week just working on the exams stuff. So I think that with the, the, the new team and the new website, that work level commitment is going to, going to drop because there's going to be a lot of stuff that will be automated and won't mean that I have to do as much work which I think is is fantastic and as I say just got Matthew Garrett joining the team to help relieve some of the workload but I don't have 52 people joining or 53 people joining every month it would be great if we did I think we've got uh, eight uh, we're just below 1800 members and I really hope that we can get over 2000 and I think that it, it's really possible because I think what we offer as a society is so good and so beneficial that I don't understand why more people don't do it. And certainly if you've got people in America, the, the price structure is, it's about 135 pounds if you don't get a physical copy of the, um, of the magazine and everything's online. And if you consider, if you broke that down, it is so worth being a member. The, the benefits of being a member are just, as I say, the lectures, the magazines, and the community aspect is, is, I think, really important. In relationship to myself, you know, fundamentally, I, I want to follow the example that I think you're doing is, is being a good role leader to my, to my son and my daughter. Um, my son doesn't particularly love magic. He will do the opposite of what your son does, is that if I say to my son, oh, do you want to show a magic trick? He will literally run off. Uh, and that's giving you the context that my son knows mnemonica and my daughter's not that bad at it either. My son actually helped me learn mnemonica when he was eight and a half years old. So he is quite capable of doing it, 
he just doesn't necessarily want to do it but i i want to carry on earning a living i, I been working on a on a secret project about a stage show that uh, it's not not for me but with someone else i've been very lucky that i work closely with with dynamo on on, on different projects so i've worked on three or four of his tv shows uh, i came up with concepts for his stage show i worked on his close-up show and he's been doing some zoom stuff recently that when he needs help he'll he'll call on me and ask and i'm always there to to help and I just want to earn a living. I love, I love what I do. I'm not, when I was at school, as I said at the beginning, I was told I was stupid and I'd never achieve anything in life. Now I could be stacking shelves in Tesco's and that's not me saying that stacking shelves in Tesco's is not a good job. I just don't think I'd get as much enjoyment and love doing what I do if I was stacking shelves in Tesco's. Mm. But, I, but I love that feeling of putting a smile on someone's face. And that can be done just as much by helping someone fulfill their dream of becoming a member of the magic circle. Or in truth, you know, I, I spoke to somebody yesterday who didn't get the result they were looking for in relationship to their interview. And they weren't disheartened in relationship to the advice and the support that, that I was giving them. And they talked about how they were going to improve their for in six months time when they come back they were talking about the things they were going to add and I was able to give them some pointers in relationship to things that maybe they should look at that would help them be able to do that now in truth I don't need to do that I can just turn around to someone and go that's it goodbye see ya Adelaide you know goodbye whatever uh, that's Vida saying that was the word I was thinking uh, <laughs> and uh, but I think we have a moral responsibility to every single person Yes, there's some people who aren't going to meet the grade, but as long as we can encourage them to get to that point, that is the important thing. There's no personal gain for me for doing that, other than the fact that that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're helping someone fulfill their dream. You've, you've got, had people that have, have looked at old magic books and they've seen the magic circle written in the back of it and always, always dreamed to become a member. And they've worked towards that in, in the same way is that I think what, you know, from a personal level, and I can I can't dictate the decision for anyone else. But for, on a personal level, I think you have been doing fantastic things. And it would be very easy to turn around and be negative towards us as an organization. But I think you've really embraced it. And you've said, you know what, I'm going to show you that I'm a better person. I'm going to show you that I, I, I want the best for the society and for the magic community. And I think that's a real, real credit. And I absolutely commend you for the, for the, for the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Honestly, that means so much, Bob. It really does. Uh, goosebumps, genuinely. Thank you. Um, this has been an incredible interview. And I know that a lot of people are going to watch this. And to sum up, everybody that is watching this, I don't think there's a reason why you shouldn't join the Magic Circle. Uh, I really don't. With everything that's been put in place and with how proactive every single person in the circle has been oh, uh, uh, over the last few years with the with the unlocked which have been absolutely fantastic and the uh, the team that you're working with I mean you've mentioned Matthew Garrett a couple of times I, I love Matthew I've worked with him several times Matthew's an amazing don't, don't forget Brian Porter he I, I, one of the benefits of having Brian Porter in the organization and part of the the, the team is he made a really good point when he applied for the role he said, well, I'm an amateur magician who's got the AIMC and he's he was a he worked in a school. He was a deputy head. And it shows that you've got both levels. You've got me who's working out there. I've you know, I've worked with Dynamo. I've done royal weddings. I've done celebrities. I've been out there treading the boards, walking the streets, trying to get shows for people you've heard of and you've never heard of. But. He's also been that person that's achieved his goals of becoming as getting the highest level that he can get in something that he loves and doing those things. And, and don't ever underestimate the, the power of in every individual and, and also anyone who's a member of the Magic Circle. Anybody can help. Anybody can put their foot forward and go, do you know what? I want to help the circle, whether it be applying to be a member of council, whether it's helping 
ushering on a on a show or or a, there are so many things and it's all done by voluntary donation of time which and is incredible which is incredible the fact that everybody is just donating their time it shows how much passion that, that everyone has for just wanting this you know the circle to grow and improve and 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 just get bigger and bigger it's it's great it really is and and you are right I, I think some of the best magicians in the world are amateurs and hobbyists. Um, I think that when you become a professional magician, sometimes you might make decisions in terms of what you perform. You don't necessarily want to do it, but you know you have to because it's where you make your living. Whilst with an amateur, they get to perform the routines that they, you know, that they they want to do because they they haven't got get constraint on them. So I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, we, 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 we spoke about a, a really good amateur earlier on. His name's Guy Hollingworth. It's his, it's his hobby. He's, he's exactly. amazing. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that sums it up perfectly. I mean, you can't think of a better name than Guy, Guy Hollingsworth. Exactly. Um, perfect. You know, this has been an amazing interview. Like I said, Bob, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to put down at the bottom uh, how people can join the Magic Circle. Um, so there's going to be a URL coming on the screen right now. Uh, there's also going to be a link in the description down below. So uh, if people want to reach out to you themselves and have a chat with you, is there a way that people can contact you directly? Um, so in, in relationship to the, to the Magic Circle, uh, the, 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 the email addresses will be the Magic Circle, something at the Magic Circle. But because I never remember what that is, I'm going to tell you the one that I know which is TMC exam team. So TMC EXAM TEAM at gmail.com. That comes to the exams department. And that means that will be seen by my team because it's not just me that deals with everything. I know that this interview is, is me talking about the process, but it is just as much Brian and Matthew as it is me and 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 that's the thing that's so important and and that's where i also think the grounding comes in because if someone turns if if for example i saw something and go i don't think this person's good enough it's not my way or the highway i ask someone else's opinion as well and if they turn around and go i think you're wrong but there we go we've got a discussion and it's more likely to happen because they because someone's saying yes than just me turning around and saying no they're not good enough because yeah. also remember that isn't our decision that goes to council and we will present that that information to council anyway but i think with great power comes great responsibility and it's very important that you don't forget that power and become a dictator rather than a than a than a leader i suppose is a better terminology very very true so the description is going to be uh, the the url is going to be at the bottom please reach out to bob and his team and, uh, you know, if, if it's something you've ever thought of doing and you put off, now is the time. Absolutely now is the time. Uh, when was the best time to join the Magic Circle? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> When's the next best time? Right now. Yeah. Um, so, Bob, thank you again. Guys, if you have any questions for Bob, leave a comment down below in the, uh, in the video. Uh, he will be sent this link and hopefully if there's any questions he, he... Well, if there's any questions you can always send them to me and you can put my I'll send you the replies and you can you can put the answers down that's that you know I don't want anyone to feel that we aren't approachable as a team I don't want anyone some people have said in the past oh the exams team is scary that's the last thing we want to be we want to be approachable we want to say come on come and have a drink We'll try and see what we can do to help you. These are the things that are so important. If you have a dream, it's not my place to shatter that dream. And what a perfect way to end this interview because uh, you are very passionate and this has been a really great interview. I've really enjoyed chatting to you, Bob. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to say the same thing to you that I said to David Penn. With people like you, um, uh, you know, in the positions that you're in with the Magic Circle, I'm sure it will continue for another hundred years and be just as successful as it always has been. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. So that was the interview with Robert Pound, guys. Um, look, to reiterate with what I said to Robert, I absolutely feel that every single person worldwide should join the Magic Circle. There hasn't been and never been a better time to join than now. The benefits that you get from being in the Magic Circle are 
insanely good. And yeah, it's going to go through its highs and lows and there always going to be politics. But ultimately, it's a fantastic uh, club to be a member of. It really, really is. And uh, I wish that they'd let me in again, but they don't. So, hey, it is what it is. But guys, if you have any questions, leave them down below. I'm sure Robert will see them. And remember, with regards to the rest of the questions that you normally ask me on a Q&A, if you put them down below, I promise I will get to them next Sunday. And anybody that asked me a question on last Sunday's Q&A, I promise I'll get to it next Sunday as well. So it's going to be a bumper Q&A next Sunday where I look at two weeks worth of questions. Leave a comment down below. Did you find this video useful? Would you like to see other videos on a Sunday like this? Please let me know in the comments. Don't forget, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below, and I'm going to be back again tomorrow on Monday with three videos, a shorts at two, a magic live at six, and then a five by five at nine. I'll see you then. My name's Craig from Magic TV.